for the second of our revised mini ITX case reviews. We're looking at this one. This is the Lian Li Dan A4 H2O, a case which is specifically designed for accommodating, as the name suggests, liquid cooling up in, well, it's kind of hard to see with all the stuff, but it's in there. We've got a 240 millimeter liquid cooler in here, hence the name H2O. Uh, despite the fact that Lian Li's website contains multiple instances of both H2O and H20. Pretty sure it's supposed to be H2O, so we're gonna go with that. The case also has some impressive GPU thermals for the size that we'll talk about later due to clever airflow management. But there are drawbacks, including the cable management. Now at the time of writing, the Dan A4 H2O is available for $155, which puts it up against options like the Fractal Terra that we recently reviewed, uh, which is above it at $180, and the Cooler Master NR200P for about $145. And that depends on the exact model, but there are tons of mini ITX cases out there these days. We're only just getting started rolling into more reviews of them. Uh, this one we wanted to get to next because as another sandwich style mini ITX box, it has managed to position itself as one of the mainstays, at least variations of the Dan case. This design goes way back and they've brought it forward over the years. So uh, this is going to be an important one for us to continue developing our testing approach. Let's get started. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly and the CryoSheet graphene pads. These CryoSheets are molecularly stacked in the Z-axis to encourage vertical direct thermal transfer from the IHS to the cooler. CryoSheet pads are made to be easily applicable for a thermal interface and completely avoid paste dryout because it's not paste. It makes them particularly useful for lawn service life systems with minimal maintenance. They come in multiple sizes for suitability on the most common laptops and desktop CPUs, and you can learn more at the Thermal Grizzly Cryo Sheets at the link in the description below. Okay, so this is the Dan case build we did. We've got uh, an SSUPD case over here as well we're considering. But we're currently, as I was saying, in an exploratory part of our test methodology development process. Uh, as we continue to iterate on things. So you can check out our terror review for more discussion on how specifically we're approaching ITX reviews. And that's gonna keep evolving, but instead of recapping it all here, just check out the terror review. It'll be linked below and that'll give you kind of the foundation. You can see this one has things compartmentalized on two sides, similar in only that aspect to the Terra, but otherwise they're mechanically very different and uh, thermally, of course, very different because of the cooler support. So this deviates quite a bit from our last one, which means some of the components have changed, like the cooler. But GPU compartments over here, you can see that interestingly, the card actually ends up upside down for this case, and it's attached via riser. The power supply is back here behind it. And then on this side, we have the power supply showing through here. We've switched that for this review as well. And the rest of the system is over on this side, surrounded by cables, which is going to be something we talk about today. So the A4H2O is a direct descendant of the original A4SFX, but with what it calls, quote, improved hardware compatibility, which mostly means it's larger to allow things like a triple slot modern GPU. The next main difference is the H2O part, the ability to mount that 240 millimeter liquid cooler radiator in the top of the case. The original A4 SFX only supported either 92 millimeter or 120 millimeter liquid coolers with heavy compromises. There are other tweaks versus the H2O's precursor, but most of the focus is on the liquid cooling given the name, and so that's the only way we're testing it today. Now, if you don't know, the Dan cases are manufactured by Lian Li, and uh, this is one way of telling is looking at how the snaps are manufactured for the panels. We actually have some old factory footage we'll dig up and show in here, but uh, where they're attaching these pegs to the panels for some of the original Dan cases on, uh, I think at the time that might have been an aluminum piece, but this is made by Lian Li, and uh, Lian Li actually manufactures a lot of the cases that are on the market. Sometimes they're larger, sometimes they're smaller, but they act as a supplier for some of these boutique manufacturers. Aside from the obvious potential for keeping CPU thermals more in check versus a small air cooler, having the 240 millimeter CLC take up essentially the entire top of such a case helps to prevent hot air from lingering inside. 
This has an impact on other components in the case as well that we'll see an effect on in the thermal section. One of the biggest features with this actually is the removable bottom panel, where if you look at this, I've already taken one screw out, but it's got five screws that go in it, and that gives you an access port to the bottom edge of the motherboard and also to cable management for underneath the power supply. So this ends up being actually an extremely useful feature to have because with ITX, one of the most important things is improving ease of installation by adding quality of life building features. So panel comes up like this, it is ventilated, and there's also a, an SSD mount kind of thro thrown in there at the bottom. And then once we get access to the underside, we have better ability to manage the cables. So this is more exposed. You also have a decent amount of accessibility to plug in modular connectors if you're using, and you should be a modular power supply for ITX makes it a little easier to access the other edge of the video card. And then in terms of motherboard access, um, we are also freed up a little bit along this edge here to make connections or manage cables. Now, dimensionally, the case measures in at 340 millimeters long, 141 millimeters wide, and 251 millimeters tall, which is larger than the advertised, as in on the website, 326 by 140 by 244 millimeters. The difference between advertised and actual here, especially at 326 versus 340, also means the calculated overall volume is 12 liters rather than the 11 liter number that Lee and Lee declares. This is another example of the manufacturer choosing to ignore protrusions like screws and case feet almost arbitrarily. And again, we stand by our decision to include those protrusions. And this is a gripe we have with cases in general. This isn't just a mini ITX thing. This is all cases. Sometimes they choose to ignore things that stick out of the back of the case. So one such instance at Computex, we saw a case, and we'll see if they come to market like this, where they were electing to not count an additional one inch protrusion out the back because it wasn't part of the structural case. It was just a hard drive cage or something. And at the end of the day, our belief is pretty simple. Uh, even if it's not counted towards the volume, it should at least be counted towards, as a protrusion, the dimension, whether that's width or depth or height, whatever it is. Now, this next part is part of the feedback we got on our Terra review from the audience. Part of that feedback was to include a footprint figure, meaning the two-dimensional area that the case takes up on a desk. Uh, we integrated a lot of the feedback, as you'll see in this review, like switching power supplies from the community, but some things were not integrating, and we wanted to use this as an example of one of them. So a, an area calculation as a review metric doesn't make a lot of sense, and really what you actually need is just simple length by width, and that's kind of it. As an example, the A4H2O's footprint calculates out to 479 centimeters squared, so try to visualize that. We think it's even less intuitive than volume, and it mostly serves as a semi-arbitrary way to try and create one number to hierarchically rank cases. Footprint loses the directionality of length and width measurements, which are what matter for visualizing the area a case will take up on a desk, and a theoretical case that measured 50 millimeters wide by 400 millimeters long would have roughly the same 200 centimeters squared footprint as one that measures 141 millimeters by 141 millimeters. It really doesn't tell you anything. So this is just to say, even as we continue to iterate and try to add fancy reviewer metrics and new types of testing, uh, a simple reminder that we don't always need fancy reviewer metrics. Sometimes you just need something you can get from a spec sheet, even without people like us, to tell you what it is. So once again, basic dimensions, if, if they would measure them more honestly. Now we're gonna get into the build notes. This is talking about build quality and ease of installation and what this is meant to do. The Dan case, as we worked on it, it's extremely clear. This is built to do one type of build and it's meant to do it very well. And that's not a bad thing because we'd rather have a chassis that's designed for really one specific type of thing, like including a large liquid cooler, rather than something that tries to do everything and does nothing particularly well. So getting into it then, both the power supply and the radiator mount to removable brackets within the case, which has become a popular approach in small and large cases alike. It gives flexibility to the designer and it can have ease of use advantages for the builder. Once assembled, the radiator and the bracket install without much hassle, as long as there aren't too many wires to manage. These fans act as the only active airflow for the rest of the case as well. 
and there are no additional fan mount locations. There's basically zero wasted space in the motherboard side of the chassis. Everything fits extremely snugly, which, if you're trying to get the smallest thing possible with the largest parts, is a good thing. The Asus Z790i motherboard that we're using has a particularly bulky rear I.O. cover that barely clears the radiator section at the top, and we had to angle the board in from the bottom edge first to make it fit. The top edge of the board is barely accessible with radiator fans in place, but that can be mitigated by leaving the cooler out or not fully fastened into place until finished with the motherboard. Let's talk about power supply installation. It's pretty straightforward, except for one note, which is that depending on where the on switch is located on your power supply, the thickness of the cooling solution, the size of the GPU, all this stuff, it can affect the accessibility of the power switch itself. So we would recommend toggling it on before you install it. However, if you didn't toggle it on, you can remove four screws, which I've already done, from the bracket for the cooler here. You see we actually have a decent amount of movement still. This will reduce as you clamp down the cables more, of course. And then that gets us access to the power switch. Now, once this cooler is down, we can still just barely access the outer edge of this. But depending on your power supply, it may become less accessible. And more importantly, depending on the length of the GPU, you may end up blocking some of that channel. Now, installing the GPU, we found, is easiest when you flip the case upside down. It's not required, but it does make it simpler. We didn't encounter any real problems with this process, and the space within the GPU chamber is generous, considering the overall size of the case and the size of modern video cards. We'll talk more specifics about GPU fitment a little later. Once the card is screwed in and the case is standing upright in its final position, the GPU will end up oriented upside down. Thermally speaking, in most instances, being upside down like this won't really hurt anything. So uh, something like a vapor chamber is already in, in a standard ATX case. Effectively, in most designs, it's worst orientation when it's like this. And that's because you're fighting gravity at this point. So being upside down uh, in a horizontal, or I guess this would be a vertical in a traditional case, upside down in a vertical uh, installment like this isn't going to hurt the performance of the cooler in any meaningful way, at least based on what we've researched. And you can see our interview with NVIDIA's thermal engineer, Malcolm Gutenberg, for more discussion on the orientation topic for GPUs. There's some flexibility for two-slot cards, so two standoffs are included that allow the user to mount the GPU into the outer two slots rather than the inner two. This is intended to help by giving the GPU more direct access to fresh air through the side panel. We tested both configurations for our thermal section later. Our main complaint with the A4 H2O is cable management. It's more non-existent than it is bad. There aren't any dedicated cable management features or tie-downs. Lian Li just throws two cable ties and an implicit good luck into the box. Compacting the components this closely together leaves the user with very limited areas to shove or tie up cables. There's really only under the power supply or in any area of the GPU side that isn't occupied by the GPU itself. It's definitely workable. We got it all to fit. You'll just spend some time getting it to look really nice. But in ITX, this much is expected. Our Fractal Lumen S24 RGB has individual cables for the fans and RGB of every component. So fishing them through the case and later finding places for the excess length to go was a challenge. Or at least a challenge to make it still look good. We could have managed the wires in a more tidy fashion elsewhere within the case, but we wanted to keep the GPU side uncluttered for our GPU fitment testing. The motherboard side of the case leaves the user without any other choices but to lay cables over the top of the board until they can go into a more permanent area of free space. With careful planning and a lot of patience, you can definitely end up with clean looking builds. It's just not easy. On to fit and finish, the case is constructed in a straightforward, almost formulaic way with flat exterior panels attached to an inner frame via push pins. In this respect, it's similar to other Lian Li built cases, like the SSUPD Meshroom and the original N-Case M1. In terms of build quality, despite the use of some thinner stamped metals in a few places, the case retains surprising rigidity, Where and this is even with four screws removed from the radiator tray, where uh, it is a, a sturdy and stout build as it's assembled. Now, you take pieces out individually, sure, you can get some flex in there, but once it's actually built, uh, it's structurally sound in a way that for something small that you might carry around is actually a positive. For fitment of things, the CPU cooler clearance is only 55 millimeters, but 
that's fine here because running an air cooler goes against the entire selling point of the H2O, which is support for 240 millimeter liquid coolers. It is important to keep that clearance in mind though for the CLC pump block. It's best to opt for coolers where the tubes exit the side rather than the top. So as an example of this, some of the deep cool coolers, especially those older ones with the really funky designs, they'd route the tube out and back in to circumvent the Asetek patent. Things like that where the block starts getting taller uh, might not actually clear or you might struggle to fully push down the panel. Same thing with like Arctic's liquid coolers for the liquid freezer line, for example, where the tubes stick out of the top. Even in situations where you can accommodate something like that, if you start to uh, basically kink the tube too much, you do potentially run into new concerns, like either bowing the panel out in an unsightly way or restricting water flow if it's actually bent. The upper area where the radiator and the fan sit measures at roughly 275 millimeters long, 132 millimeters wide, and 58 millimeters deep. This is tight enough that users need to pay close attention to the dimensions of the cooler that you want to use. The Arctic Liquid Freezer 2240, for example, doesn't fit here. The manual's suggested tube routing represents an ideal case that isn't easy to replicate with the Fractal S24 CLC that we have. We ended up needing to squish down on the tubes with the side panel to make it close, but we don't think it's to a problematic degree. Ultimately, it's worth experimenting with different mounting locations or tube directions for the best result. Now for GPU fitment, the GPU side of the case is spacious and forgiving compared to the motherboard side. Video cards up to 322 millimeters long, 150 millimeters tall, and three slots or 60 millimeters thick are supported. There's even considerable space by ITX standards over the bottom of the upside down GPU. Installation of video cards is also pretty easy. So the front of the case has a large cutout, just a big hole in it where you can just slot it in or you have some maneuverability if you need to push it around for cable clearance. So let's look at some large cards as an example. Installing the RTX 4080 or 4090 Founders Edition cards is difficult, but it's not impossible. Once it's in there, it takes up almost all of the available space in such a way that makes us think the size of these coolers was a critical dimension during the case design process. Since the vertical space is so generous, even exceptionally tall cards like the Asus Strix Vega 64, that's obsolete, will fit fine. The XFX RX7700 XT is too long to actually fit the one that we have, but thanks to the open hole at the front, it's technically possible for GPUs of infinite length to slot in. One of the other pieces of feedback we got in our Terra review was on the power supply choice, and we agreed with this one. So uh, despite some of the power capacity advantages of SFX L power supplies, we've come to appreciate that a lot of users or a lot of builders of ITX cases will just use a, an SFX power supply especially because modern ATX 3.0 power supplies, let's say 850 watts, even in the smaller form factor, are sufficient for the majority of builds. So we've actually switched to the Fantex power supply we have in here for our ITX testing going forward as the standard. And then we'll use the SFX L power supply in cases where we just want to see how it fits but not necessarily for, say, thermal testing or baseline testing. Now that said, the A4H2O does support SFXL models with the obvious reduction of cable management space below the power supply. And for this one, we'd agree with the commenters last time. You should stick with regular SFX if you can, because having all that extra space, it starts to add up. So that's all the build section. Now we're going to get into the thermals and the acoustics for the case. As we get into this, keep in mind that our goal with ITX reviews is to review only the case. So we're analyzing things like the impedance caused by the panels and the airflow path and the uh, compactness of the components affecting thermals as well. So because of that, these results can't be compared to our other ITX case reviews due to different coolers. That just becomes a cooler benchmark. We already do those separately and potentially due to different things like BIOS settings or fan speeds. Our default setup, as we're calling it for the A4H2O, has the system at a fixed 62% fan speed on the CLC, 100% on the pump, the motherboard fans are off, and the GPU is in the interior position with fans at 44%. The GPU fan speed is chosen by the nominal fan speed under the standard VBIOS temperature targets, while the CLC fan speed is chosen based on noise targets. This results in 36.5 dBA as measured in accordance with our old ATX case testing methodology, which is outside of the chamber in a noise floor of 26 dBA. Noise analysis from the hemianechoic chamber comes later. The default setup at steady state had the P-core average at 57 degrees Celsius delta T over ambient, 
locking the CLC fans instead to 100%, dropped it by 5.4 degrees. It actually outperforms the no side panels result, which does have the reduced fan speed, and that and the small change between no side panels and the default result stand as a testament to the efficient airflow pattern that the A4H20 provides. All of the airflow is directed through the top-mounted cooler, pulling air over most of the other components, and the panels end up not being too restrictive, as shown by our panelist test. Flipping the power supply around so that the fan faces the GPU isn't covered in the manual, but it is possible. In our testing, it didn't change CPU thermals. The same can be said for running the two-slot RTX 4070 in the outer position, but the data leans slightly warmer on the averages. That brings us to GPU thermals, where we have the GPU die idle load hotspot and memory temperatures. The default setup is actually the worst on the chart, but the 53 degree over ambient load average is still completely fine. That has us in the 70s with ambient added in. Running the CLC fans at 100% didn't move the needle for the GPU, despite extra air movement into the case, but flipping the PSU to aid the flow through 4070FE dropped 2 degrees Celsius off the load and hotspot readings versus default. Pulling the side panels gained a little more, but as always, it's just to illustrate the impedance caused by case design. The real winner here, and the interesting part, is that the outer mounting position for two-slot cards is actually useful. That setup reduced our thermals between 6.8 and 8 degrees off of core load, memory, and hotspot. That's a massive gain for a GPU, and that's without any changes to fan speed whatsoever. That's because the GPU is now in a position to draw in fresh air from directly outside the case. So the flow-through exhaust has more space to blow into, and that warmed air is immediately pulled out of the case by the CLC. This is what an efficient and less restricted airflow path can do for you. Noise levels are simple for this one. We've done a number of deeper explanations on our acoustic testing process now, including our video showing the build-out of the hemi anechoic chamber, the news video that followed, the terror review, and the ROG Ally review. You can check each of those videos if this process is as cool to you as it is to us, but for this one, we're just going to look at one chart. Because this isn't comparative against other ITX cases, again due to a change in components between the smaller Terra and the larger Dan case, we're only going to look at noise characteristics between the choice we found most impactful, the GPU positioning. There's no point comparing the Terra and the Dan case for noise levels because they use different CPU coolers, so it wouldn't be a comparison between the cases. If you're running a two-slot card in the Dan case, especially with one that has a flow-through area, we'd strongly recommend using the outer position based on the thermals. But we need to see if that meaningfully impacted our acoustics. This will vary heavily based on the fan blade design of the GPU behind the panel, but the FE card uses a fairly standard modern blade design. Plotting the GPU stock position first, we saw the noise profile of the case from straight on, at one meter distant, was loudest in the 500Hz to 900Hz range. Loudest here just in the comparative against the other frequencies, but not actually in a bad way. Overall, even in this range, the profile isn't indicative of any deviations that would be perceived as particularly unpleasant to a listener, especially as caused by the case. This makes sense. The panels aren't perforated in a way that causes a whiny or turbulent noise from the fans that we used and from the air movement. So we have a frequency spectrum that primarily represents the components chosen and doesn't reflect much direct negative impact from the case. Adding the GPU outer position to the chart, there's functionally no difference in results. Moving our card to the outer position had significant thermal benefit, and it didn't have any objective acoustic change. So there's really no downside to doing it this way. So the Lian Li A4, or Dan case A4H2O, is a competent and small mini ITX case. It doesn't try to do a lot of things. It does one or two things really well, and that's about it. So you don't get a ton of freedom or flexibility in your design choices with how you're laying out this case. And that's fine as long as you're aware of it. The case probably shouldn't try to do many more things at a size like this. Also, in terms of pricing, mini ITX cases tend to run really expensive. The Fractal Terra at 180 bucks, uh, there's plenty of like 200 plus or minus $20 ITX cases. And at 155, it does end up being one of the more competitively positioned cases where, yes, there's some options like certain NR200P variants that actually are very worth considering even today that are nearby. Uh, and there are a few ITX cases that are particularly relevant. 
cheaper in price, and we'll get to those, but we're still adding ITX cases to our testing. So our opinions here for value will change with time. Subjectively though, the experience in both the design by Dan and the manufacturing by Lee and Lee really come through. We liked working with the case. It does have challenges primarily with cable management and with some motherboard access after the build, but ultimately, we think that they're able to cram in a lot of large components like a 240 mil CLC while keeping the smallest possible external footprint. The thermals are good and really impressive for the size particularly for a two-slot flow-through GPU like the 4070FE. While we wouldn't recommend going wild with part selection, compared to the Fractal Terra, we'd be way more comfortable with running higher-end parts like a 13700K or a 4080 in this box. There's some thermal headroom to spare even from our configuration. Now back to the note on price. So despite being cheaper than things like the Terra or Form D options, it does feel a little expensive just strictly for what this is. So ignoring the comparative, where comparatively, it looks like a better deal. It's also not the highest quality materials. Uh, they are using thinner stamped metals in a lot of cases. There's a lot of steel. There's no variation on material, like the Terra can at least cling to the fact that it's stuck some wood to the case. So for the materials themselves and the complexity of the case, it does feel like it's a little on the expensive side. And then you zoom out and look at ITX, and uh, it's just that the whole market segment is just more expensive than what you're used to from ATX for much more case. And a lot of that has to do with, well, two factors. One is just economies of scale. There's lower volume still of ITX, so manufacturing cost is higher. And then the other one is boutique market where enthusiasts are willing to pay. As for who this is for, Really, it's going to be anyone who wants to get higher end components into an ITX box, especially on the CPU side, because having that clearance for the 240 uh, CLC really opens up options. Having too large, like as a normal size, 120 millimeter fans also allows for a pressure system to develop where you're able to suck out any of the uh, pockets of hot air. I was, I was trying to avoid saying the phrase hot pockets unless they pay me. Uh, <laughs> and, um, so it can pull out pockets of hot air a little bit easier. And uh, that's a benefit of this case because in a lot of other smaller boxes like the Terra, there's not a lot of room for traditional fans and certainly not full thickness ones. So going for a higher end CPU with a larger cooler, this is a good choice for you. If you're a user who has no interest in higher-end CPUs. You're going with like an i5 non-K CPU. The liquid coin's not of much interest unless you just want to run a really ridiculously low fan speed to get the lowest noise possible. But there's other solutions to that too. The people who might be the most frustrated by this are ones who want perfect cable management or if you're using a motherboard that you particularly need more access to it because as you fill this in, it does get covered. So that's it for this one. We have a lot more to do with our ITX case reviews. So uh, we're still developing our processes, our component choices, things like that. And as we add more cases, uh, we'll be able to publish basically a full, hey, here's the methodology as it's going to stand for all of the reviews. But for now, we're still in the exploratory phase. So uh, we'll continue working on these. Not sure which one we're going to look at next, but we had a lot of good suggestions in the Terra review. And leave your requests for the next ITX case review in the comment section here as well, because we will be reading them. Please upvote each other so we can find the ones that people are most interested in, and we'll buy or acquire that one next. But that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. As always, you can go to store.gamersnexus.net to help us out directly by buying something like the solder mat I worked on or patreon.com slash gamersnexus. And we'll see you all next time.